This book does not behave by the rules. Dream logic dominates. All bets are off. Better than food, man. Full, 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 full. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I'm your host, Cliff Lee Sergeant. Great to see you as always. It's a little early here, so I think my voice is a few octaves lower. All right, today is very exciting. Allow me to bring you one of those books that got swept under the rug of the literary canon in the 20th century. One of those strange works of fiction that are unlike anything else you've ever read, but because of the time and place of their author and production was nearly destroyed and eradicated. But it wasn't. It's here, translated in English. You can buy it, but it's not well known. Maybe you could call it... Nah. Now let's just dispense with genres. This is beyond genre. It's a disturbing, Kafka-esque, almost Cronenbergian, Cuban, Gothic, God knows what. It's just one of those, you gotta read it. Today is La Carne de René, René's Flesh, by Virgilio Piñera. This was recommended to me by Kit Schluter, who translated Marcel Schwab's The Book of Manel. Uh, guy's got great taste, and this book is unbelievably unique and strange and we'll get to it. In English, flesh and meat are two different words. In Spanish, they are the same. Carne. Spanish fuses the two concepts in the single word carne, which is used in phrases like flesh of my flesh and flesh and blood, as readily as in meat pie. In René's flesh, Piñera seizes on this linguistic duality to express one of his central axioms, that life is one big existential slaughterhouse in which we are at once the butchers and the butchered. That is from the translator's note. Piñera was a Cuban novelist, playwright, and poet. La Carne de René was published in 1949. It belongs in the realm of the theater of the absurd. It's a surreal tale with the tone of the Marquis de Sade's 120 Days of Sodom and Pasolini's Salo, though nowhere near as graphic sexually. In fact, most of the grotesque instances in this book are kind of indirectly sexual. The scenes are viscerally disgusting, but it's behavior that doesn't make any sense. There's no rape or graphic sex at all, actually, which you keep expecting. But what Pineda does is describe things that are just totally off, which somehow makes it even more uncomfortable because you really have no clue what's going to happen. This book does not behave by the rules. Dream logic dominates. All bets are off. Leave your expectations at the door. It's a grotesque Buildings Roman coming of age story about a man growing up and being forced to accept the sacrifice of his flesh to the world, to relinquish his power, to stop running and accept his abysmal fate as the member of this hideous political party or secret society or something. He's forced to experience the hideous world of the carnal, a word which seems similar to carne, just Spanish for flesh, which is what René's flesh is confronted with, the world of flesh. Another world of flesh which seeks to impose itself on his and make use of his flesh, tear it apart, dominate, engulf, and assimilate it. Everything is about flesh in this. Flesh, flesh, flesh. La palabra carne. Todo el tiempo. What does all of this mean? Or rather, what is it all a metaphor for? If we look at Piñera's history and day-to-day -day reality, when you look at the context, you can kind of understand where this came from. The man in this novel is being hunted, pursued, stalked, captured, and forced to submit. If it sounds confusing, it's because it is. Outrageously confusing. Following some sort of nonsense that only this story operates on. I've never read anything like it. So what is the actual story? René is a young, passive, timid man with a weak constitution, living under the thumb of a hideous patriarch who keeps moving the family for unknown reasons, as if they're always on the run. René gets sick with the idea of violence or butchery easily, with the idea of meat in general. One imagines Piñera being a vegetarian, but one who can appreciate the art of Francis Bacon. In fact, we open the novel in a butcher's shop, where René is running an errand for his outrageously domineering father. In the line at the butcher's shop is Miss Perez, who's kind of a predatory lady chasing after Renee's flesh as well. Renee, kind of a weak constitution, again, confronted with the sight of all this butchered meat, is about to pass out in line at the butcher's, and she tries to keep him from doing so with like smelling salts or something. Everybody wants a piece of Renee's flesh. Everyone. His father, the woman who's chasing him, the instructors at this sadistic boarding school thing his father sends him to, the members of this strange political cause related to his father who are tracking him, Everyone. This book is saying something about identity. I don't know what, but it's... There are these doubles that keep appearing. 
uh, doubles of Rene, you know, doppelganger type figures. His father is threatening him with the coming school that he's supposed to attend, where he will learn something about pain and flesh. And he shows him a St. Sebastian painting, you know, with the arrows, but with Rene's face. He's drawn Rene's face on the figure of St. Sebastian, and then his father stabs him with a needle. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe he says something like, that's your birthday present. So, uh, it's not subtle in that respect. Then after that, he forces Rene to go to this school, which is kind of like a Catholic boarding school for boys or something. And upon arrival to the school, Rene finds a life-size Christ statue in his bathroom shower. And the face on the Christ resembles Rene's. It's creepy, no? And then later on in the story, Miss Perez's desires become increasingly depraved and absurd, warped, to the point where she has a mannequin in her tub that resembles Rene. It's a parody or alternative version of something that's already happened, this, this theme with the doubles. And then later on in the book, he actually meets his double. Miss Perez is after Renee's flesh just like his father is, and like the instructors at this school, which resembles something closer to a place of torture. It's like a boarding school or a Catholic prison, I don't know. The school's motto is suffer in silence, and its students, all boys, are muzzled, branded, and referred to as dogs. One of the older students, who has gone through what we can only assume is hell, is shown to the other students, and when he stops in front of Rene, the description is haunting. The maximum exponent of such a feat was Roger, who without a doubt would receive the highest honors of his course. Marblo signaled to him. Roger left the line and walked past each neophyte, showing him his face. Rene trembled when he found that face before him. It seemed to him that that face had reached such extremes that it could never retrace its path. Yeah. Creepy. But his father's motivations are sort of quasi-political. Not really, though. It's just all sorts of fucked up. He wants him to join this cause, to inherit this political position, which is all involved with the fight for... chocolate. Por que chocolate? Well, it's revealed later because it puts flesh on the body. Or something of that nature. I don't really know. I don't understand. It doesn't make sense. It's not supposed to, in that respect, I don't think. So what is this sacrifice of Renee's flesh? What does it mean? Is it the erotic ideal reduced to base desires? Idealistic notions reduced to capitalistic exchange of flesh? Maybe. What will peace and quiet cost for Renee? Are they even attainable? No, not really. Try as he may to continue to outrun everything, he eventually realizes the futility. The story of Pineda is a sad one. After La Carne de René was published in 1949, it seems like he went through the gauntlet. He moved to Argentina, and after having the praises of Borges, he moved back to Cuba and had some problems. Or they continued, maybe. Pineda was gay. It sounds like he was openly gay. Or openly enough for his life to become incredibly difficult because of it. I know nothing about Cuban politics. Nada. I know that there was Batista, then there was a revolution. Cuba, after Castro's revolution, suppressed Piñera. Cuban culture at the time seemed to be very homophobic, machista. And in the About the Author section of the book, at the very end of the novel, it doesn't mince words. He died impoverished and forgotten in 1979. It was brutal, from all sources I've found. It doesn't beat around the bush. Piñera suffered. His writing was suppressed. They did not want him to write. They didn't want him to write. They didn't want him to publish. They didn't want him to do anything. In post-revolution Cuba, as it says on Wikipedia, the gay community was seen as a threat to the military order. There's a documentary I've linked to below where this fellow being interviewed, named uh, Yanni Ibanez, I think his name is, says that Pineda wasn't marginalized. He was erased, eliminated, prohibited, blacklisted. They didn't want him to write. Hence all the trouble that Pineda ran into, living in a country with a period of total decadence and then crazy political turmoil, followed by a revolution and suppression. Not even having the recognition of someone like Borges could make things better. That's the crazy thing about life. Sometimes the things that you think would save you artistically can't compensate for the day-to-day -day reality of the shit you're forced to deal with. It's a sad truth. It really is. But it's one we need to prepare for and guard against. Just because things are good today does not mean they won't change tomorrow. One should not take things for granted. And I'm not saying that Pinata did. Just, it's a reminder to myself. And also, if one's going to be a genius and be against their time, it's almost like this fellow says in the documentary, Yanni Ibanez, it costs you your life and your wits, and it can't be any other way, because it's like that. The character's only change in the book is that finally, in acquiescence, he submits. 
beat down, no longer able to tear himself away from the flesh. Like it says in the foreword, his every action from the first chapter to the last consists entirely of flight, a pathetic flight, like a metaphysical bet, as step by step he comprehends in horror that he is waging an impossible battle. He can never escape his own body. The impossibility of Renee's desire makes him an essentially tragic figure. So you get that kind of lone wolf struggle in Renee's life. Someone who not only did not fit in, but actively resists fitting in. Maybe that was the same problem for Pineda. So he finally submitted to the flesh. He acknowledged he was gay. Not to reduce the book to anything, but it's an interesting theory. And Pineda paid for it, you could say, with his flesh. He suffered the consequences. Of which, it seems, for just being gay in Cuba at that time, there were plenty. So at least he's recognized now, but that's no consolation for him. Especially considering how material he believed everything to be. Now, this is no good to him. It came too late. Everybody loves you when you're dead. Así es la vida. So, better than food. Hmm. So who should read it? I say this is definitely for fans of Kafka, Saad, Casares, Borges even. But also for fans of Chuck Palahniuk or Dennis Cooper. I tried to get into Cooper, didn't really enjoy it. Read The Marbled Swarm, meh, not my thing. There is certainly a style similar to Casadas in this one, that kind of tasteful class that appears in Argentinian authors, I feel. Borges and Casadas. Pineda was moving in those circles, so it would seem that would be where the influence comes from. There are similarities with this one, I feel, but it's more of a strange classic feeling. A Kafka, Saad mix that I really haven't come across in anything else. It's got a consistent tone of doom for this character. Also, if you enjoyed Wiesmann, I'd check it out. It has that kind of sumptuous gothic quality in Against Nature or La Ba. So, yeah. Hope you enjoy. Check it out. Time for the coffee lottery. For those of you who are new, the Coffee Lottery is where I take all of the names of the patrons on Patreon who have donated $5 or more to the show, I place their names in this mason jar, I pull out a name for every review I do, and I send that patron whose name I pull out a hard copy of the book I'm reviewing, plus a bag of coffee roasted by yours truly. And I'm drinking a delicious Ethiopian right now, and it's wonderful. And life is good. So, if you would like to get in on that and support the show, and help people find the greatest books they've ever read, you can click on the link in the description box below, or go to patreon.com forward slash books are better than food, and donate five dollars or more per video, and I sincerely appreciate it. If you donate a dollar or more, you can get access to the patron-only reviews, plus the private Discord channel, which I'm going to set up soon, and also the uh, Better Than Friday news posts that I send out every Friday, which is just a list of five items that I'm interested in. Books in the pipeline, films, music, all sorts of stuff, articles. It changes week to week. If you think we have similar taste, you'll probably enjoy that. Best of luck to all the patrons. You're making this possible. I really appreciate it. All right, here we go. Jack. Thanks a bunch, Jack. Really appreciate it. You're going to receive Renee's flesh and a bag of delicious coffee. Thanks a bunch. Hope you enjoy. Look, my mug's black now. Crazy, right? Please subscribe if you haven't already. Please hit the like button if you enjoyed this. And please always remember to bring a book wherever you go. Pretty soon you'll be finishing more books. And that's great. It's all about time management, man. All right, that's all I've got for you today. Hope you enjoy this completely outrageous, unique piece of literature. Take care of yourselves. Thanks for watching. Have a great night. I'll talk to you soon. Ciao.